Hello everyone, welcome to Room and Board. My name is Chris George and today we are taking a look at the five reasons you shouldn't back Sleeping Gods 2 Electric Boogus News. Sleeping Gods 2. This time it's not Sleeping Gods 1. Sleeping Dogs 2. Air Bud World Pup. <laughs> But before we start this video, this video is not sponsored by NordVPN. In fact, Brenda has asked me to stop calling her. So because of that, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. If you want to do your good deed for the day, I'm saying at the beginning, so you can think about it all video, see if I earn it. Because it's hard out here for a YouTuber, and that sort of thing helps. <laughs> or, in this case, if you really hate me, smashing that dislike button will feel so much more satisfying because I'm so desperate for your approval and affection. <laughs> and anyway, I have to say it now before everybody leaves. Oh, it's too late. It's too late. Oh well. I'm still in a good mood today, and if you stuck around and you are new to the channel, let me tell you that the premise of this series, which I've been doing for quite some time now, is not meant to make you not have fun or not be excited. Absolutely not. I am incapable of achieving fun and excitement in my own life, and so I need to live vicariously through you. But with these sort of larger board game campaigns that have raised over a million dollars, there's always some sort of FOMO attached or fear of missing out. And so my goal with this video series is, as always, to make sure you take a moment before pulling the trigger on an expensive purchase and purchasing everything you can for Sleeping Gods, that you do take that second and make sure that you will be as excited to purchase the game as you are now when it arrives at your door however many months later. That you don't have any regrets. Instead of buying a cat off of a certain VPN saleswoman, having that adventure wear off fairly quickly and calling said VPN saleswoman over and over at her house to try to change that horrible mistake you made in your life. But I want that excitement for Sleeping Gods 2 Don't Wake Apollo to consistently reside in your being. So let's get into the reasons why I am excited about Sleeping Gods, because it's always nice to start with excitement. Before we use our internet influence to make Red Raven Games lose one million dollars immediately and crush their dreams completely. <laughs> And also because somebody needs to bring me back on track because I have gone off the rails with bits and I cannot guarantee that that will not continue. <laughs> and Sleeping Gods is a game that has only been out since 2021. It's only been around for about a year. It was delivered to backers uh, around February last year in 2021. And in that year, I feel like it has been very much front of mind and has been getting these rave reviews, at least in the circles that I follow. And maybe it's just because it's something that I've been hearing a lot about as well because it was a continuous tender in our monthly room and board deathmatch tournament that we have every month over on this channel, where it was a contender for the best epic game of all time. And uh, no spoilers, but it, it did fairly well. Or maybe it won the whole thing. Who knows? Check that out. It doesn't matter. People were also upset that it wasn't included in the best solo game of all time tournament that we had the month before. And the fact that there are so many passionate fans out there and that it has almost cracked the top 100 on Board Game Geek. It's ranked 113 right now. I mean, these are all instances that make me sit up and want to take note and see what is special about this game. And, and subsequently and assumingly that will be special about its sequel as well. And so why not give people more of what they like? The art again looks fantastic. This one is taking you through a portal through the sky, transporting you to a rugged landscape of bizarre creatures, scheming gods, and untold dangers. I mean, that tagline alone gets me excited. And I haven't personally played any games by Red Raven or Ryan Lockett, but I've always been particularly drawn to them because of this unique and beautiful art style. These are memorable covers that make you want to have the game on your shelf even if you're not going to get around to playing it for a long time. <laughs> because it looks gorgeous, you can clearly see the passion and the care that has gone into all of these projects. And I think the reason why there is a sequel is not because they knew Sleeping Gods would be a hit and so they started working on it. It's because they felt like there was more to explore in this world. They were excited with the world that they created and they said, well, you know what, we're not done with this story. We're not done exploring this universe. We can do more here and exist here. And likely, if you've already purchased Sleeping Gods, and I know many of you may have already, and you enjoy it, this video may not talk you out of it. I'm still gonna try. 
I'll do my due diligence, <laughs> as is the duty of this series, but it, it may not talk you out of it, and that's okay. It's okay to love more of a thing that, that you already know you love. And so some of the things that I love about this game, I love that you can wander to anywhere you want on the map, and when you hit the edge of the map, you just turn to the next page and you're on a, another portion of the map, that this map is this continuous large sea filled with islands that you need to explore. I love that the branching narrative paths of Sleeping Gods are some of the things that it's been most praised for, because hey, I love a good branching narrative path. And they even promise to let you learn the game through a specific comic book intro which I think is so cool. Like what an awesome way to immerse yourself in this story and to learn the mechanics of the game by going through that prologue, that little mini prologue that is drawn beautifully. It's exciting. It's exciting that you can interact more with your own group of characters, developing relationships between them, which was one of my favorite parts of the Fire Emblem video game series, that your characters would have these little side conversations in battle and would create a relationship and boost each other if they fought next to each other often. And I think that's really fun, and I think that's really cool that they are focused on fleshing out not only the world this time, but the experience of your crew and how they relate to each other. I say crew because the first Sleeping Gods was on a ship, and this one takes place of your crew on a plane, but I think the terminology still applies. So those are the things that are drawing me in. The art, the reputation, the accolades, the promise of an epic adventure. And honestly, I, I just like supporting smaller teams. This is a small team of three people who have been pumping out Sleeping Gods and have pumped this out since that campaign finished. And seeing a, a small ragtag group of heroes have this much success is awesome. But it's too bad they've gotten too big for their britches and need me to tear them down a peg to make people think whether or not this is a responsible choice. I guess you should have canceled when you got to 999 and started a new one. That would have been a loophole, completely avoided this whole video. <laughs> but it's time to get my mean face on. No, that's not, that's not the right, it's time to get the mean, mean face on. That's not, I'm Canadian, damn it. Okay, mean face. Perfect. Let's go into the five reasons you shouldn't back. I can't even keep that straight. Uh, let's go into the five reasons you shouldn't back Sleeping Gods. Because like anything, there are reasons why people won't enjoy the game. And reason number five is if you hate skill checks. Now there is no rule book currently available, or at least not one that I have seen for Sleeping Gods 2, Poseidon's Big Comfy Bed. But the fact is that it is a sequel. It is not a new game. It is a direct sequel, means that you should be prepared for more of the same from the original game. And this is good, because we can look at the original game, we can see if that's for you, and if that isn't for you, then likely the sequel is not for you either. Although they do have some tweaks that they have made, which they highlight on the campaign page as well. There's a little bit more freedom of travel, because your plane can teleport you to spots around the map, rather than having to sail your ship around directly to get there. There are also more resources to find. There's 12 resources now, and some of them are more rare, which, eh, as long as that doesn't impact the availability of the resources or the difficulty it is in completing the quest and make it a little bit more of a slog as you try to find these various resources. Sure, I'm, I'm sure that's a fun twist. It doesn't really affect things, I, I don't think. But I, again, I, I might be wrong. One of their biggest changes is it seems like they have abandoned their command counter system that they used in Sleeping Gods. In Sleeping Gods, you would have a number of characters or items or whatever, and you put a little command counter on it when you use that thing, and then you have to take an action on your ship to wipe all your command counters away in order to then reuse that action. So just in terms of how they cycle things, now you'll have a hand of cards that you just, well, you just play cards when you want to use them, which seems a lot simpler. <laughs> But one thing, the main mechanic behind deciding what happens on your adventures seems to be making skill checks. You're gonna have a deck of cards, you're gonna flip one over, see a number, add any modifiers, and see if that number is greater than the number needed to do whatever you were trying to do. Ah, you did it! You opened the chest! Oh, look at that! You didn't fall into that pit, but you flapped your arms like you pretended you could fly, and at that exact moment a gust of wind lifted you up and landed you back on the edge of the rope bridge that cut and fell, almost sending you to your death. And I've been thinking a lot about mechanics recently. I, I recently went through Board Game Geek's all of 182 of their listed mechanics, just to make sure that I was absolutely clear on their definitions. And then I, of course, ranked them 
for fun, and, and likely I'll make a few videos about this. But the mechanic of stat check resolutions, for me, in that ranking, came in at 74. And this is a bit surprising to me. I, I don't mind stat checks. I like playing D&D, &D, and D&D &D basically is all just stat checks. Well, storytelling, but the mechanic is, huh? did I do it? I didn't do it. <laughs> I definitely uh, like stat checks, but it is not necessarily something that I personally crave to see in my games. And realizing that it was just at sort of a middle level kind of helped me cool my excitement a bit, which is good because I put forward the image and tendency of having a logical, sensible mind, and yet I am a feather for each wind that blows, and am easily excitable by shiny, shiny, beautiful things. <laughs> so focusing on that sort of core mechanic and deciding whether or not that is something that you enjoy doing and you enjoy having in your games, I think generally that's a good idea. Either way is fine. You can love stat checks, in which case this is a positive for you. Or you can feel middle ground to not excited about them, in which case just make sure that this experience won't get too tedious for you. You want to make sure that you can put your best hand on the end of your leg forward towards your hypothesis for fun. Now, reason number four is if you dislike choose your own adventure books. This game, like its predecessor, will be about story, 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 and different stories. And if you don't like those choose your own adventure books that you may have glimpsed a reference of with the flap your arms and learn how to fly, I think that was in an R.L. Stein carnival choose your own adventure book. If anyone's read it, let me know if I'm right or not. But if you don't like those choose your own adventure books, I think this flat out, this isn't the game for you. There is going to be a giant book and you're gonna be constantly flipping through it. You're gonna to flip to a page and read a little text and it'll say, oh, do you wanna go this way or this way? And you're gonna to flip to another page and read a little bit of text. And they've included the foreteller narration app in this new iteration because some people mentioned that they didn't like flipping through large books of text. But the core idea of that gameplay the narrative choice that you are going to get to make. This is just a next level choose your own adventure game. These are replicating the dialogue choices that a computer would do for you in a video game. And honestly, this is one of the main draws for me, that sense of exploration and adventure and secrets behind every door. And I absolutely love the quest system where if you meet someone specifically, you'll get a little quest card and it'll have a keyword on it. And then when you go to a passage in a book, if that passage has that keyword, you can relate it to the previous person that you talked to. They've given you this information. You know that that's not just a hut on the island. There's a hidden floorboard where you can find something important, but you would never know that if you didn't talk to this previous person. I, I think that idea is so fun and so cool. And I love that the quest stack of cards is huge because it means that I'll get to do that thing over and over and over again and search out these sorts of things. But if that sort of thing doesn't get you actively excited and you think that it will be more fiddly than fun, I mean, hey, you're gonna be doing this probably as much as you'll be doing skill checks, if not more, then again, this is something you should rethink purchasing. Now, reason number three relates to the price and it's that 15 bucks isn't enough of a discount for me, maybe for you. And usually when I look at Kickstarter campaigns, I like to look at the shipping and see if the shipping cost offsets the benefit that you get from the game. And so of course it is just so, so poetic that shipping to the US is $16. <laughs> you save 15, but you gotta spend 16 instead. <laughs> I mean, it's just, of course it is. And actually, I don't think this is an unreasonable shipping price at all. I actually think it's a quite a good shipping price for the current shipping situation. Likely this game is gonna be filled with cards and it will be a heavy, heavy box. And we haven't yet unlocked the two campaign surprise bonuses that will be unlocked on the 22nd of April and I think the 28th of April because you all were so manic in your fervor to purchase that I had to film this video before then, before that stretch goal surprise is revealed. But my perspective on this campaign is specifically shifting because there is an original version out there. And so, hey, if you already own that, again, this one may not apply to you. But I look at every single board game campaign that goes across the internet every week. And I look at it from a, is this a deal perspective? How much are you getting? What are the stretch goals like? What offsets the cost? And the general value of the pledge, if it's gonna be 
more expensive later on. And at $85, honestly, this isn't a horrible price point. This is a pretty decent price point. Sleeping Gods, the original campaign was $70 US, which translates to me to be about $87 Canadian, and I can get Sleeping Gods currently in store for $94, $95 Canadian. So it's cheaper until you factor in that shipping that I would have had to pay. And this one is 23 bucks US, which is like $30 Canadian in shipping to get to me. So it's a bit more for Canada. I anticipate if I get Sleeping Gods in store, it would cost me less than if I purchased it at the Kickstarter price. And so therefore the decision has to come down to are these stretch goals worth it? And if you look at the current stretch goals, say it with me, you don't need metal coins for campaign games. <laughs> or if you think you do, you likely already have a set from a last campaign Kickstarter that you purchased that you're not playing and you're gonna wanna play Sleeping Gods 2 without too many gaps so that your memory remembers the outline of the story and what's going on. Likely you can steal your metal coins from some other game and keep them in the Sleeping Gods 2 box. If you're desperate for the feel of cool metal touching your toes at the end of your arms. Or, and this is actually the main point that I wanted to make here, because Sleeping Gods exists. And if you don't own either, when Sleeping Gods 2 Narcoleptic Zeus arrives in the hands of backers a year from now, likely people will be done with Sleeping Gods 1 and they will be selling it and you can get it at a discount, potentially the Kickstarter version, even at that discount. And hey, if you were thinking about buying Sleeping Gods 2, you're gonna have to wait until then anyway. So just shift your mindset in terms of, yeah, I'll wait until it's arriving to backers and then I'll pick up someone's copy of Sleeping Gods 1 that they're done with that is still in pristine condition because board gamers, for the most part, aren't animals. Although, judging by the comments on my Massive Darkness 2 insert solution, uh, people, people know that I am an animal with my games. <laughs> But at that point, at that point in time, when you would be receiving that Sleeping Gods 2, you can go out and get yourself Sleeping Gods 1 because great games remain great regardless of when you get to them. And if you wait, sometimes they're able to show their flaws and articulate why it may not be the best spending decision. Now, reason number two you shouldn't back Sleeping Gods 2, I'm all out of jokes, is <laughs> that Sleeping Gods 1 wasn't necessarily that replayable. At least from what I've heard, and I try to always make my way through as many reviews as I can when doing these videos because I like to do my due diligence and I'm not just gonna talk without doing copious amounts of research that uh, none of you will ever see. But this game takes place over the course of 18 events and then you're done. That's the, that's the journey of the game. You're gonna pause the game throughout but it's one overarching thing and you see if you hit one of these 13 endings. And the fact that they isolate that there are 13 endings makes it feel like there, there are 13 games that you can play through here. But from what I have read and what I'm guessing, I feel like these 13 endings aren't going to necessarily be 13 wildly different experiences, but maybe it's more like the endings at the end of Deus Ex Human Revolution, where it's, ah, which button do I push? <laughs> wow, it's a different ending. <laughs> Whoa, you succeeded in getting all of your totems on the, the land. Or uh-oh, you didn't. And this, again, isn't necessarily a bad thing. And it may not be a bad thing for you. I don't think campaign games need to be replayable. I can't personally think of a campaign game that I have played that I am itching to replay because there are so many other games out there. So why not play something different rather than play the same thing? I feel the main draw to campaign games, at least for me, is the story and the discovery, or those that have a heavy focus on narration, I should say. And so I'll always be interested in that, in that story and discovery, and when that doesn't exist, my interest for it wanes. I've got a game of Betrayal Legacy going right now, and what I particularly enjoy about it are the discoveries that you make throughout the house. I don't necessarily think I would want to replay that campaign again once I'm done. So if you were thinking that, hey, this is a lifestyle game, I can do it 13 times, I think just be aware that there will be a point of diminishing returns where you've seen it all and you don't necessarily need to go through the motions or going through those motions will be less satisfying. It might not be. If you are the type of person who loves to reread the same book over and over again, hey, that replayability 
might actually be there for you. But I, I think for the average person, it likely will not. So if you were going in hoping for that aspect of it, I don't see that necessarily changing in Sleeping Gods 2. And again, this is completely fine. It actually counteracts my next point a little bit, but not really, because my point number one is that you still have too many campaign games. <laughs> I know you do. <laughs> and this has been a previous point on previous videos, and it will likely appear again because it remains to be true, and it bears repeating, and I know some of you need the reminder. <laughs> because I need the reminder. Even though I have Seventh Continent PTSD, and it reminds me a little bit of that, it's still giving me enough things that I do want to try it. I think the narrative system feels fun. But this, maybe combined with number three, for me personally, is the main reason why I can't back Sleeping Gods. I'm not allowing myself to do it, because I've run out of time for large campaign games, especially spending so much time on YouTube. And so in the sense that it isn't replayable, and that it is potentially a shorter campaign game, is tempting me. It's kind of tempting me in the direction of purchasing it. It's a one time through, you're done, that's all you need. 10 hours, you could do it in one day. Ooh. What a delightful little treat. And that shorter campaign time makes me want to push all the other long campaign games aside and just jump into it. Or I even think, oh yeah, I'll be done those campaign games by then. It's so much time. No, you won't. I mean, some of you will, but some of you will still be drowning in wave two of ether fields because you haven't even cracked the surface of wave one. Not mentioning any names. <laughs> so this is the type of game that uh, honestly I wish was a video game. I would buy a cheaper video game version of this in a heartbeat because I could blaze through it, I could redo it all the time. Okay, maybe not on a heartbeat, but I would wait until it was on sale and then wait until it was on sale again and then wait until the third sale and make sure that third sale was equal to or less than the other sales and finally talk myself into buying. That's usually my process for these sorts of things. <laughs> and so I think this game is likely to be another lovely story because why shouldn't it be compared to the first one being so well received? And yet I know personally that I find it hard to get campaign games to the table, even at a solo or a two player count. I know I love the concept, but it doesn't necessarily translate to me personally in practice. So be honest, have you gotten through your campaign queue yet? And is this one worth pushing all the other ones aside for? So that's it. Those are my five reasons you shouldn't back Sleeping Gods 2, The Empire Snores Back. So let me know your own reasons why you are purchasing it or why you aren't. Have you played the original version? Are you excited to just dive into this version? Are you getting everything Sleeping Gods, which I really don't think you should do. They have this Sleeping Gods pledge tier, which annoys the heck out of me. It's going for $200 and then, but make sure you check their add-on section because you can actually just buy it for $80 US and you don't need Max Journal. You don't need the extra play mat. You just don't. You can get it for less than half the price of all this content, or even just add in the expansions if you want all the gameplay content. Don't be fooled by that level. Like that is the number that you should be paying because it is absolutely not. And it's also, you know, over $50 markup from what they were selling it in the first one. But what, what about this campaign interests you? I'm always interested to hear because I always want people to change my mind in the comments. And also, I find the comment section is an incredibly valuable resource. If you are debating making your decision, you can hear from not just me shouting at a camera, but you can hear from other passionate fans one way or the other and see why people like the game as well. So make sure you drop them in the comments below why you're interested or why you're not, because I'm, I'm interested to hear from you. And it's always great to not just be speaking to myself in a void. I hope you found this video helpful and ba balanced in deciding whether or not Sleeping Gods 2, for the last time, Gerald, go back to bed, I'm not gonna tell you twice, is worth backing. <laughs> and if you get the game, hey, I hope you love it, and I hope you love it even more than Sleeping Gods 1. I hope those changes that have been made are perfect and elevate the game to beyond your wildest dreams. And if you don't get it, hey, that's good, because it's probably not for you. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you being here. Once again, my name's Chris George, and uh, I... I don't have a catchphrase. I wish I did, but I don't think I'll ever come up with one. But I hope you have a great rest of your day and that this sequel proves to be better than the original. See you in the next one. Sleeping Gods 2. This time it's not Sleeping Gods 1. Bring, bring. Oh, 
my car fault. Now, Danger S, it's the Coach Z here. That's not it, what is it? It's me, I need you to come to the office away, right? I mean, right away. Uh, I'm in the car right now, but I can drive it to the office. Sounds like a plan. How was that? Okay, car phone. Get ready for a bumpy ride. I think that's, I think that's how this one's gonna go. <laughs> Move that to the end.